Hey, it's so good to uh, see everybody uh, here this morning. And, uh, you, you know, I was talking to someone uh, about just after, I think it was level two, level three, I can't remember. I came here to the office one day. I think it's level two. You can't come out in level three, isn't it? Yeah. Can't remember. Anyway, so I was talking to somebody and I said, look, I'm actually really privileged to uh, pastor a church uh, that is strong in the Word of God. You know, uh, with COVID-19 and uh, what we've uh, been through and actually the world is going through. Uh, but for us as a church, as a pastor, what an honor and a privilege it is for me and Cara to pastor a church who know the Word of God and who are willing to stand in the Word of God. Amen. And when tough times come, you know, in Isaiah it says that the, the enemy comes in like a flood. And the virus did come in like a flood, but the Lord raises up a standard. Amen. And so it's an honor for uh, pa Cara and I to pass to the church. And you guys are wonderful. And uh, I believe we are in an exciting season. You know, there's a restructuring or refocusing and going back to the basics and going back to not kind of doing church, but actually being church. You know, you can do church, but to be church, you got to be with Him who called church. Amen. And so this whole uh, kind of dwelling in the Spirit of God. And uh, I've been dwelling in the book of Acts lately, and I want to carry that on. And growing up for me as a child, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, we were Anglican. I'm the fourth generation Christian uh, in an Anglican background, and up until I was 14, we went to church. I knew about Jesus. I knew about the Father, but there was no great emphasis about the Holy Spirit. I actually didn't even know that there is such a thing called born again. You know, I was born into a Christian family, and I thought, that's it. I'm a Christian. And, uh, but I never knew there's something called born again. I never knew there was something called the Spirit of God that dwells in me. Not only does He dwell in me, but He empowers me, amen, to, to live in this earth and to fulfill His plan. I never knew that. And uh, there was very seldom mention about the Holy Spirit. We celebrated the Pentecost. We celebrated the, the, the whole, uh, the, the celebrations that the Jews celebrated. I don't know why we as an Anglican church, we did that. We did it. But it was just a celebration. But there was no real concept of the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are some churches which seem to be so sold on the Holy Spirit that they talk of little else. There's, some churches you go to, they're full of just Holy Spirit. And uh, they just wait in the Spirit of God and nothing else matters. You know, and then there are some churches that are so weary of the danger of this emotionalistic experience centered Christianity that it wears them for, for going to a Pentecostal church. You know, I said, oh, those Pentecostal people, they are fluffy Christians. Um, I got called that too. You know, you penty, you know. Uh, but I think, I think we've got to understand, but you know, this, we've got to realize, by, when you're reading the Bible, when you start reading the Old Testament or the New Testament, you begin to see that the Spirit of God is all over the place. The Spirit of God ministered to people in, 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 in the Old Testament, and it is so evident in the Old Testament that the power of God came on certain individuals, and they were empowered by God for such a time as then, and, uh, and they fulfilled the task God actually put before them. One of those guys was Gideon that Dan talked about, Kara reinforced it, I am repackaging it again. But here we are, he was a man who was timid, but then the Spirit of God, when the angel appeared, something happened, there was a divine shift that took place. Now that's the power of God. It is not the power of man. It is not your talents, it's not your giftings, it's not your eloquence of how well you speak, it's not your education. It is the power of God that manifests. And when the power manifests, you begin to see and recognize it's not you, but God who lives in you is operating through you. 
And I believe as we sort of church, kind of post-COVID-19 for us, we need to go back to this basics. And I've been saying that we are a Pentecostal church. We are a church who believe in the manifestation, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can quote the scripture, but do we live that scripture? Acts 1.8, the power comes. You know, you, oh, the Holy Spirit comes. You know, what is it? Come on, help me, somebody. Acts 1.8. No, 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 no. No. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You know, we quote those scriptures. Well, at least I tried. You know. And, uh, but we got to really live in that power. How do you live in that power? You got to submit yourself to God. Amen. Hallelujah. We see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. You know, in the wilderness, there was a t the wilderness tabernacle. The presence of God was in the tent in the wilderness. And the presence of God dwelt in the, the whole tabernacle about presence living in a tent. And wherever they went, they took the tabernacle. The tent went with them. And they journeyed together. Come into New Testament. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he's saying, hey, you are the church. The Spirit of God lives in you, plural. He lives in you as a group of people. You are the church. The, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He's talking in a plural form. And we are the church. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. There is no need to go to a temple anymore. There is no outer courts in... Out of courts, inner courts, holy of holies. We the, you, you, are, you are the holy of holies. The living God lives within you. Hallelujah. And the power of God is not to show off or have power, but the power of God in us is that so that we can live for Him, we can grow into maturity, we can grow into holiness, we can grow into righteousness, and we can be ready for the judgment day. Hello? A lot of us don't focus on the judgment day, but He is coming. Yes. Jesus is coming. Yes. And He will judge you and I. Yes. But He's not going to judge us because we've done a few little things here and there. Because He said, I've given you power. What was your excuse? If I was Jesus, I would be saying that. I'm glad I'm not Jesus. <laughs> See, so that's what Paul is saying. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And most of us, I don't know why, but Christians, especially, um, you know, in the Western world, we have privatized Holy Spirit. We have privatized it. It's like, you know, me and my Holy Spirit, my husband and my children. We are happy. You know, me and my Holy Spirit. And it's, no, the Holy Spirit has come on you. I'll show you through the scriptures. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you cannot privatize it. It's publicized. You have to live it out. It's not just for you to feel good. I felt it. Whew. I know I'm mocking. I shouldn't mock. But bear with me. You know those people, right? They go, you know, oh, that was a good service. Oh, we had a great time today. Oh, I, the presence of God was tangible. Oh, I felt it. Hallelujah. And then we go out, we are the same. Are you with me? We go out and we go, mm, my wife doesn't respect me. Mm. You know, we are to carry the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go. He, he's not a switch on and off button. He lives in you. The God of the universe, the God who created you and I, lives in you. You are so precious to Him. You are so valuable to Him. You are so, uh, so I mean, God so loved the world. He gave His life for you and I because He loves you. He lives in you. How much more worthy are we because He lives in us? That He's picked you and I and He's called us for such a time as this. Amen. And you look at it, the vital part of the early church, the Holy Spirit was, was vital in the life of the Holy, vital part in the life of the New Testament church. It was very evident. And Jesus' mission was not to judge the world, but to save the world. 
Luke 19, 10 says that he came to seek and save that which was lost. The whole idea of Jesus coming on earth is to not judge us. One day he will come to judge us. Amen. He will judge us. He's coming back soon. And you and I as children of God, we are to live like as if he's going to come today. So can I just say, if Jesus is appearing today, I want to ask you something. Go rectify those relationships. Go ask for forgiveness. You know, reconcile with one another. Do whatever you can. Be ready because he may come today. We don't know. But we are to be judged one day. So what is the point of God's Spirit dwelling in us? What's the point of God's Spirit dwelling in us? It's a good question. You know, thank you for asking me that. So, so it's not just about what ha happens on the inside. What really matters is what happens outside. And there are so many big questions about the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, the, the whole tongues thing. And I, my parents thought that I was actually going to a Pentecostal church. It's a cult because they speak in tongues. And, uh, and there was so much misunderstanding on that. But there are a lot of questions that people don't understand. Just because they don't understand, they get scared and they don't actually explore it. But we shouldn't be distracted from, these, from an urgent task that is to actually have the Holy Spirit in us and to go out there and reach people who are actually lost. Amen. We need good understanding. We need good teaching on the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk to you. My title this morning is called From the Upper Room Down. From the Upper Room Down. And why, why do I say that? Let's look at Acts chapter 2 verse 2. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven. There was a sound from heaven. And we know the story that it came as a mighty rushing wind. And, um, and, and so that sound from heaven. The, whatever happened in the upper room on that day, it was, it was from God. So my point is the kingdom of God is not from this world, but for this world. God's kingdom is not from this world, but it's certainly for this world. Amen. So we, we are not to operate in the realm of the worldly nature. We are not to operate because where do we receive our empowerment? Where do we receive our revelation? Where do we receive our wisdom? Where do we receive our conviction? Where do we receive our authority? It's from God. So when God came, that's why the kingdom of God is not from this world. So we are not, especially we who know God, are not to operate as a worldly way. We are to download from heaven, amen, have the mind of Christ, and have the nature of Christ, and that's the hard part. We can have the mind of Christ, but have the nature of Christ and then go out and live there and not to, not to allow the world to influence us, but we are called to influence the world. Amen. Not many amens. It doesn't grow from this world, but it, will, but it is for the world. See, the world wants to do its own thing. I've been doing some Bible studies with the, with the, with the young adults uh, on Zoom. We still are Zooming. And I've been doing some Bible study. We looked at homosexuality and what does the Bible talk about that. And we looked at the culture of this world, the whole autonomous culture, independent culture. I will do what I want to do because I have the right to do what I want to do. No, you don't have the right to do what you want to do. One day you have to give an account of your life to God. So can I ask you, who is influencing you? Is God influencing you or is the world influencing you? In your decision making, in your lifestyle, who is influencing you? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to come from above? To fill you fresh and to anoint you so that you can actually, it's like the upper room down, not from the ground up, but we receive from God and then we permeate. When the Holy Spirit came, He came in the upper room and then when Peter and the disciples came down, the message spread all across the globe from there. That was the epicenter. 
of Antioch Church. My point to Acts chapter 2 verse 5 to 13. I want to read a few scriptures today. Point to it says, the Holy Spirit draws us together into oneness. I've been talking on this. Acts 2, 5 to 13. It says, at that time where the devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. The Holy Spirit united people together. That's one of his roles. The Holy Spirit draws us. He does, he, you know, he draws us and he draws you and I together. What makes us connect together is God. What we have in common is God. What we, our mission, we have one mission, and that is to be the light and the soul of the earth. So what connects you and I is God. When my wife and I took over this church a um, few years ago, what connected you to us is God. You invited me into your house. Why? Because of God. And let's pick it up here, verse 7. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are from Galilee. Yet we hear them speaking in our own native language. Wow. You know, we, we, we have some people here who speak Tagalog, who speak Hindi, who speak Telugu, who speak Tamil, who speak Singhalese, who speak Dutch, who speak Afrikaans, who speak Russian, who speak Korean, who speak Malaysian. Uh, is there a language called Malaysian? No. Uh, uh, Malaysian Chinese. Malay, 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 exactly, Salama, Malay, yeah. They speak Malay, Malay, and we got so many languages right here. Amen. So many languages right here. So the people are recognized. But what unites us together is the Spirit of God. Yes. You know, I eat with my fingers, you eat with chopsticks, or some eat with forks. I tell you, the best way to taste food is with your fingers. Amen. I got two. Amen. Amen. Anyway, I better behave. Okay, I better behave. All right. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed, these people are from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native language. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts in Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. I was thinking, where were the Indians? <laughs> Why did the Indians miss here? And the Arabs were here. But this is a beautiful thing. Listen to this. This is in verse 10, 11, sorry. And we all hear these people speaking in our own language about the wonderful things God has done. Hallelujah. What unites us together, you and I, is God. Amen. Don't look at how you eat to how I eat, how you behave to how I behave, how you were brought up to the way I be brought up. No, no, no. What unites us is Jesus Christ. What unites us together under that one banner is the mission of God, that we have a role to play. Imagine if we all are in unity, one purpose. If you all came here today, purpose in your heart, I'm going to bless someone. I'm going to bless God. I'm going to receive from God. I'm ready to hear from God. And I want to encourage somebody. And then we do that. Church comes to life. Yes. Then people don't have to avoid you. <laughs> if no one's saying hello to you, that means there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I better behave. Yes. Okay, come to this. So, but look at this. There were... All, they were hearing about good things. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But the others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they were just drunk, that's all. I don't know what happened when the Holy Spirit came. I don't know whether they were drunk. I mean, there's so many translations, so many uh, uh, interpretations of what happened there. But I would never witnessed were they kind of going like this or they were the... Mumbling, I don't know what happened, but there's, there's always a cynic. 
That's what it tells me. There's always a cynic there. Oh, that's not, oh, they're, they're all drunk. So what my focus is this, the Holy Spirit brings us together. Can I encourage you, church, please know this. We cannot fulfill the mission of God if we are not united. Now, the expression might be a bit different. That's okay. But the connection has to be the same. Are you with me? Now, if you're playing a guitar, you can play the open chords or you can play the bar chords. It doesn't matter how you play as long as you're playing the same note. I don't know the building illustration of that, but... It's easy with a guitar. But, so we, we got to unite together. Amen. I want to encourage you. You and I have a mission. I really believe that. We have a mission. We have a mission. We got something. God wants us to do something. We got to go do that. Amen. Can we unite ourselves and not worry about little things here and there? Let's focus on Jesus and let's get on with it. All right. My third point in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 37. Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 13, 14, sorry, to 37. I'm going to read a scripture. I want us to read scriptures. Is that okay? Yeah. And all those people, let them know that Pentecostal people read scriptures. <laughs> anyway, okay. So here we are. Let's pick it up from verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd. I'm reading from New Living Translation. Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. I paused and I thought, okay, maybe 12 o'clock is okay then. <laughs> no, it's not. Now, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And I love the way Peter, before he shares the gospel, he begins to actually explain what happened in the Old Testament. And he begins to teach this crowd. And he's saying, look what happened in the Old Testament. What Joel prophesied. What David said. Now it's fulfilled. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And he says in verse 17, he says, he's quoting Joel chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit, God's spirit, upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. I love that. Sit down with Joseph for five minutes. He's got too many visions in five minutes. I'm seeing visions too. <laughs> but great to have visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Can I ask you, old men, if you categorize that, the Bible says it, so I'm saying it. Don't disqualify yourself. Dream dreams. Dream dreams on the younger generation that they will march stronger than you. Come on. Be permission giving. Be financial giving. Because you got more money than young people do. No, I'm serious. Invest in them. If they want to go to a camp, invest in them. Buy them a Bible. Do something. Invest in younger generation. Let them, be, let them know that you believe in them, that you're dreaming on behalf of them, that you want to see the very best of God in their lives. Yes. Don't sit there and go, oh, back in my day. Can I say that back in my day is gone? Yes. Yes. Today is a new day. Yes. And it's the same spirit yesterday and today and forever. I'm not, please understand, I'm not telling anyone off. I'm just saying, can we be permission giving? You know, if they want to break a bone, let them break a bone. But let the gospel be shared. Anyway, any youth group you go to, there's always a broken bone. Don't know why. 
In those days I will pour out my spirit, even my servants, men and women alike, they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above and signs on earth below, blood and fire, the clouds of smoke, the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and the glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is Peter still quoting Joel. People of Israel, listen. Verse 22, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazareth by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you, will, you well know. But God knew what would happen, and the prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles who nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. And now he's quoting King David from Psalm 16 verse 9 to 11. I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. Hallelujah. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. That's Peter quoting David to the crowd. And then he goes on to say, now he's talking to the crowd in verse 29. I did say I'm going to read a few scriptures. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But we were, he, he was a prophet who knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of the highest honor in heaven at the right hand of God. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to be poured upon us. Just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, make them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, to be both Lord and Messiah. Amen. Amen. Peter's words pierced, verse 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brother, what should we do? Brother, what should we do? Can I just stop now from the scriptures and want to say this. This is the same Peter that denied Christ three times. This is the same Peter that was rid with guilt. He was rid with shame. He betrayed Jesus three times. And Jesus says this publicly. Hey Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And it did happen. It's the same Peter who was so guilty. Who was so miserable on the inside. I know that because I watched Passion of Christ. You know. He cried a lot. He did. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Peter really cried a lot. And the, the Bible says Peter swore at the girl, the poor girl. <laughs> Imagine a girl going to, you know, James, James, you're the one that was with Jesus, aren't you? You know, and then after a few minutes, didn't you eat with him? You ate with him, didn't you? And he's all getting nervous now, you know. But imagine that. It's, um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? And this is the same Peter that lists the Old Testament with great confidence, with great conviction, and with great power. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of what happened in the upper room. 
Amen. And I want to say to the Lord of us as Christians, hello honey, Lord of us as Christians, Lord of us as Christians, we actually lost power. Listen to me, please. Okay? Lord of us as Christians, we've lost power. We've, we've abdicated our power. We've abdicated our authority. We've abdicated the power that comes from high. We've abdicated, we don't even know how to use the Word of God today. I don't have a Bible, I'm using my phone, but we don't know how to use the Word of God today. We don't even know how to pray today. We are struggling to pray today. I was, uh, when I was a student at a Bible college, I went to a, 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 a mosque in Hamilton. And I tell you what, the imam there, man, he preached so well. He was so knowledgeable about Jesus Christ. If I didn't know about Jesus that well, I would have come out from that place. Or if I didn't know my word that well, I would have come out from that place to say, actually, Christianity and Islam are the same. We need to know the word of God. We need to stand on the Word of God. We need to operate in the Holy Spirit. The power comes when you know the Word. Amen. The power comes when you know the Word. When your child is misbehaving, you know it's not just lack of sleep. There's something more than that. Number 4. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and 41. The Holy Spirit's revelation of the cross gives us authority to share the gospel. What gives us authority to share the gospel? When you have a revelation of God and the Holy Spirit gives us that revelation. We are trying to package the gospel in such a way where, you know, I want to make sure uh, that it's very palatable for you. Please. You know, it's like a chocolate, you know, roses. If you don't like that one, you can put that aside. Please eat what you like. Thank you. I think somehow we've, got, we've turned the gospel into a box of roses. Are you with me? The gospel is offensive. The truth is for those that don't want to listen is offensive. That's why when you have, understand the Bible, it gives you authority to share the gospel. It gives you the urgency to share the gospel. You're not looking at yourself, I'm, oh, I'm not ready, or oh, he's not ready, or she's not ready. No, 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 no. When you know the word, it gives you authority. When you understand the power of cross, it gives you authority to share the gospel. It is not a duty, it's an honor to share the gospel. Are you with me? Because it's gospel that brings salvation. It is Jesus dying on cross, raising up from, rose up on the third day, and that's why he overcame the devil. That's what made a way for you and I to heaven. That's the gospel. But you've got to accept Jesus in your heart. Amen. Peter replied, each must repent of your sins and return to God and be baptized in the name of the Father, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This, is, this promise is to you and to your children and all, to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, just like I'm doing today. You know, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourself from this perverse generation. Save yourself from this perverse generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 300 in all. That's a good sermon. That's why I'm taking a long time today to preach to you. Now, but can I just say, Jesus didn't die so you can live a comfortable life. That is not the purpose of God. It is a purpose, but not the purpose. The Bible actually says in Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted. Amen. And we think your boss telling you off, you're persecuted. No, we haven't seen real persecution. But it will come one day. 
I know that because the Bible teaches us that. Are we ready for it? Or are we still worried about a little uh, cat, Max, or a dog, Poppy, or, or my, you know, um, you know, I'm just saying stuff, but you know what I mean? We're so busy and distracted by our little world that we have lost focus on the gospel and the purpose of the mission why God placed, her, placed us here on the planet Earth. Yeah. My last point is from John 16, 8 to 11. My first point is the kingdom of God is not from this world, but for this world. My second point was the Holy Spirit draws us together into oneness. Third is the Holy Spirit empowers His disciples to fulfill the mission. Fourth one was the Holy Spirit's revelation of the cross gives us authority to share the gospel. We need authority to share the gospel. Amen. My last point is the role of the Holy Spirit in sharing the gospel. Comes from John 16, 8 to 11. It says, and when he comes, this is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's saying, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, it's not it, he, he will convict the world of its sin. There are three things that he does. He will convict the world of its sin. He will not condemn you, but he will convict you. That is the role of our Heavenly Father. So when I'm preaching the gospel, I am not focusing on how well am I speaking, but what I am saying is, God, would you use my words to convict my brother? Because in my natural, I can condemn him, but would you convict my sister? It is not your role or my role to convict people. It is not your role or my role to condemn people. Our role is to convict people. Oh, sorry, share, and the Holy Spirit's role is to convict people, sorry. It is his role to convict. As a 14-year-old boy standing absolutely in the filth of sin, I know where I was, yet in the midst of all my guilt, all my failing, all my uh, shortcomings, I just heard and sensed this amazing goodness. It was so good. It was so good that I couldn't even just kind of contain myself. And it was, I was amongst my friends. It was so good. I knew he was speaking to me. I recognized his voice while I was sin. In the middle of sinning, he, co he communicated to me his love. And all I did was just gave myself to him. And I was in tears and weeping. And my friends thought I was too drunk when I was weeping. I want to tell you, alcohol has no power when it comes to the Word of God. And I heard the Word of God speak to me. And I cried. The Holy Spirit convicts you. My friend, I want to encourage you. Don't run away from God. Allow Him to convict you. Not condemn you. Who condemns you? The devil. He condemns you. He's the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. Romans 8, 1 says, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. He will convict the world. Number two, what he does is he, and of God's righteousness. Now, let, guess what? I'm convicted. I gave my heart to God. And now he's speaking into my life to make my life be more righteous, more holy, more pure. Amen. I want to keep growing in God. And my heart is that you will grow in God in holiness. Devote yourself to God's word. I, I'm not touching on that from Acts 2, 48 to 47. You know, they're, they're, they're devoted to apostles' doctrine and what, all those stuff. But I'm asking you, listen, ah, allow God. If God is saying, Paulina, forget pastor, don't forgive. Forgive him. Sorry, not forget him. Forgive him. Don't hold on to your rights. Don't hold on to your rights. Make sure you forgive. Make sure you live free. Yes. Live free. Who wants to live a miserable life? Yes. And then, where is my salvation passport? Honey, where's my passport? 
Are you with me? You know, it's like, oh, I'm, sa- I'm saved, that's enough for me. I go to church, that's enough for me. No, it's not enough. You need to read the Word of God. You need to spend time in the Word of God. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Is that good? And the third thing that He will do is He will come. He will judge. He will judge. There are three things. He'll convict us of our sin, and He will convict the world. Number two, He will lead us into righteousness. And the number three, He's going to judge the world one day. He's going to judge. He's going to judge. So don't live life today as if you're not going to be judged. You will be judged on how you spend your money. You will be judged how you look after your family. You will be judged on a lot of things, but mainly, I don't know how he's going to judge, but he's going to judge on a lot of things. Amen. Amen. It's pin drop silence. (laughs) Can I get the worship team up, please? You know, we got to say truth in love. And I want to sh- finish with this. We want to say truth in love. But to say truth in love. You know, a lot of people leave the truth out and love people. Or a lot of people just tell the truth and leave the love out. And when you leave love out and just tell the truth, it becomes condemnation. But when you leave truth out and just love, it becomes human love. Not godly love. I don't have time to explain that. It's in Ephesians chapter 4. The truth has to be said in love. You need love, but you need truth. You need both. Because love is not going to set people free. Truth is going to set people free. Love is going to heal people. And I'm asking you today, I want you to pray about who you need to share the gospel with. When was the last time you talked about the love of God to somebody who actually has got no clue about God? We're going to sing that song, Sound of Heaven. Lord, do what you must do. Amen. Can we open our hearts to Him? Can, all we have to do is say, God, I, I want to give myself to you, Lord. I've been distracted. I've been blinded, busy, looking after my kids. Busy with my work, busy with my business, whatever that you are busy with. But God, now I come to you because I know there is no condemnation in you. Do what you must do in me, Father. Can we have an encounter with him and let the power of God come upon us this morning?